Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I really, really appreciate this invitation to discuss this important topic with you all. Uh, but before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about the language that I'll use today. Uh, so within the autism community, uh, some people prefer identity first language, as in I am an autistic female, while others prefer person first language. Uh, I'm a girl with autism. When I work with individuals, I always ask preferred pronouns and per uh, their preferences on identity uh, language. However, in this group setting, it's kind of tough for me to, to honor everyone's individual preferences. And so I'm gonna go back and forth with the language that I use and, and use both person and identity first language interchangeably. I'm also gonna start by defining some other terminology uh, about sex and gender, which are, are not interchangeable. So while there's a small but growing literature examining biological sex, in autism and differences between boys and girls, there's an even smaller, but thankfully growing literature examining gender fluidity. Today, our focus is going to be on differences in biological sex, which is quite complex literature that we'll go through some of today. Um, and so what we can, what I can start by kind of giving you a preview is that what we know about sex differences in autism is that boys are diagnosed more frequently in girls. There's no doubt about that but this difference is narrowing. And additionally, um, we, it's pretty well established that for females who do receive an autism diagnosis, they do so often at a later age than males on average. Uh, there's also some evidence to suggest that adult women seek and receive autism diagnoses to a greater extent than men. So that further supports that argument that women are even more likely to be missed at a younger age than their male peers. So I'm humbled by kind of the turnout for this, this talk today, uh, but I'm also equally excited with the interest and enthusiasm in the topic. With such a large audience, my hope is that there's a broad range of diversity among the group, and so I suspect there may be some who identify as autistic and may also identify as female, so I'm, I'm especially welcoming to you all. And I thank you um, because I have learned so much um, from um, the autism community and women and girls on the spectrum. And I hope what I share today, you know, resonates and fits some um, with your experience. Because again, I've learned so much from you all um, that I've had the opportunity to work with clinically, um, people I've met in the community um, and through research. And so I just share here um, three quotes from different individuals all touching on some of the topics that we'll talk on today. So I have a quote from an autistic adult woman um, who talks about how she over communicates all the time because she feels misunderstood um, or that what she was saying just wasn't right. And so after social interaction, she'd kind of go back over and over her mind about that conversation and what she could have done differently. And you know that led her to some frustrations. And then eventually when she began to understand autism and how that impacts her, she realized that she really can't even access that information in her brain in that moment. And that, that was something helpful to her. And so, you know, that kind of talks a little bit about the subtle social differences we might see um, females present with. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, we also, I also have a quote from a female teen who talks about how, you know, she would get into, when she'd get interested in things, she really got interested. And that could cause peer conflict because she, she would hog the art table because art was her interest and she was known as the art kid and so art's not that unusual of an interest for for children and so we'll also talk about how the interests of of girls on the spectrum while they're intense they may not be that different from their peers and last from temple grandin who um, we all know um she talks about how being you know when you're autistic you gradually get less and less autistic and you keep learning how to behave. It's like she's in a play and she's always in a play. And so we'll touch on some camouflaging um, as well today and, and how that impacts the female on the spectrum. So I wanna talk about quickly the, the recent um, Adam report. So the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network um, is a program funded by the CDC to collect data to better understand the number and characteristics of children on the autism spectrum, and as well as other developmental disabilities that are, live in different areas across 
the U.S. and they follow over 200,000 four-year-old and eight-year-old children that have confirmed medical diagnosis or educational classifications of autism. And so the last report from the spring uh, indicated that currently the prevalence is one in 36 children. So that's a steady increase from the one in 150 that was noted in 2000, and then one in 44 in our prior release from 2018. Uh, interestingly, there are also updates to the male to female ratio. So now one female for every 3.8 males is diagnosed for the first time. Um, and the prevalence for the first time is greater than 1%. So that um, is showing again that more females are being identified on the spectrum. We also see that, um, that there's an increase in the co-occurrence of intellectual disability with girls more frequently receiving that additional diagnosis. And that's, um, that is an increase as well. So we're gonna use this um, slide, you're going to see this several times to kind of organize our journey through answering or attempting to discuss why fewer females are diagnosed with autism. And so we'll go through diagnostic criteria. Um, are there concerns there? Is there bias at play? Uh, is there uh, concerns in research participation or something just about being female? Um, so we'll start with um, the diagnostic criteria. And I bring these um, men up, these physicians up, not to spark any controversy about medical history, but just to point out that the preponderance of maleness and autism goes back all the way to the, uh, the original descriptions of autism, where both of these psychiatrists describe autism mostly in boys. So As Asperger described four boys only and Connor, a uh, group of eight boys and three girls. Um, and then over the next several decades, autism continued to be diagnosed more frequently in boys. And then as the consequences for females became more apparent, so you know, if they don't have a diagnosis, they can't get early intervention services, uh, the research into whether the criteria of the diagnosis or the tools used to uh, make the diagnosis contribute to this male bias. Um, but you know, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, so we'll start our discussion um, about bias and the diagnostic criteria potentially. Um, and so we'll start with social reciprocity, a core challenge that everyone on the autism spectrum um, experiences. And in this study, Becker, Van Ammerman and colleagues compared social reciprocity on a shared drawing test where the examiner starts drawing a house and then takes turns with the child adding on to the drawing. And so this top up here um, in green shows um, the, an example from a boy with autism. Can you, I, I hope you can see. Um, and so the examiner started here with the house. And what you'll see is that the boy then just continued to draw um, <clears throat> monsters around the house, even though the examiner tried to um, you know, join in on the, the interaction. And below you'll see when the examiner um, started to draw the house and in red, um, the girl did share in the production of the house and other elements. And so the we're just looking at these pictures, but the researchers um, were able to kind of code in ways um, to quantify differences between all these drawings that the girls and boys did. And what they found is that um, girls and boys who did not have autism didn't have differences between how they um, approached and engaged with the examiner in the, in the drawings. Mm -hmm. But there were differences between boys and girls um, on the spectrum in turn-taking, reciprocal interaction, and reciprocal flexibility. And so I present this particular study because I think it's, it's nice because it's a measure it's not one of our specific diagnostic measures. This isn't something we, we use in, for instance, the ADOS, but it's more of a naturalistic measure of reciprocity um, and showing that there are differences even out, you know, outside of our measures. Of course, decreased social reciprocity is not the only feature of autism and repetitive behaviors are also in, an important part of the criteria contributing to functional difficulties. So included in this are both special interests and repetitive behaviors. 
So in this area, girls have been noted to have actually fewer restricted and repetitive behaviors, less intense, intense interests, and interests that are more typical age appropriate. And these characteristics may be expressed in ways that differ from the traditional autism diagnostic criteria. So in this study here, Grove and colleagues asked autistic adults to self-report special interests. And what they found is that the females reported significantly more interest in autism itself, nature and gardening, human body and psychology, animals, and arts and crafts. And so research along these lines have led some um, to argue that autistic females special, special interests get underestimated because they're less, these are maybe less probed for areas during assessments and not necessarily considered atypical. And I show a train here because that's often um, an interest that, that boys present with. So if autistic girls do present with differences in their social communication and repetitive behaviors from neurotypical girls, um, this suggests that the diagnostic criteria of autism apply. In other words, their, you know, their skills in these areas are different from typical development. But you know, the way these skills differ from their presentation in autistic boys might be more subtle, um, particularly the, for those um, who have average intellectual functioning. So that takes us on to, are there biases elsewhere? Um, so because, as I said, historically autism is described in males, you know, are clinicians just more primed to suspect and refer for autism related service in boys? Um, are there other factors that, that um, you know, relate to this? Like our tools, are our tools biased in some way towards boys? Or how about, are there other things extrinsic to the child? like? a parent's knowledge of autism. How does that influence how autism is identified since parents are such um, important advocates for their children? So let's start with potential bias in the providers. So we know that boys are referred for diagnostic assessment about 10 times more often than girls, uh, but why is that? So it could be that males and females vary in which features are recognized um, and reported by those involved in the referral and diagnostic process. Um, something again, that has been influenced by repeated messaging that autism is a kind of boy's disorder, right? But another cool study here, Whitlock and colleagues um, presented 289 primary school educators with description of children uh, where male and female ASD phenotypes are presented, okay? so. Compared to the male description, the female profile reflected greater social interests. So they had a friend or, but had difficulty with other peers. They got along well with teachers and adults. Um, they had more typical stereotyped interests. We've already kind of touched on this, so animals. And there was some suggestion of, of masking, so, um, or copying behaviors of uh, a child, their peer friend. Um, also, the related challenges um, in this kind of um, profile that they presented these educators for females was picky eating habits, but for boys was um, aggression with peers. And so here's where it gets interesting. They presented these descriptions with either match or mismatch pronouns. So this created four graphs here. Um, let me see if I can bring my arrow over. So we have the female profile that matched pronouns, the female profile that mismatched pronouns, the male profile that mismatched pronouns and the male profile that matched pronouns. And what they found was the female uh, phenotype with, with the matched female pronouns had the lowest likelihood of being rated as having autism, essentially. If you just take that profile and change the pronouns to male, the likelihood goes up quite a bit. And then of course the male um, profile had the highest. And so you can really appreciate the impact of, of male bias between the first two data points where the only difference was the sex of the label or the name. Um, so. so there is some convincing evidence that those who you know, are out there, boots on the ground, identifying autism are more likely to do so for boys than girls. But what about our measure? Um, so I think the evidence in this um, is mixed. 
Um, so we have some studies uh, that report females have to have an increased number and severity of autism symptoms to be identified, yet others report less severe autism traits and fewer symptoms in females, and then others just find no sex differences at all. Um, so that look, seems pretty mixed. I say at the top, probably not, um, because there is some newer research um, looking specifically at our tools. Um, so in this top study um, by Kolb and colleagues, um, um, some folks I work with here at Kennedy Krieger, um, there's some pretty convincing evidence um, that despite um, being developed pre predominantly with males, females are just as likely to have their symptoms identified by items on the ADOS. And that, just as a reminder, the ADOS is a clinician administered tool that is most, you know, very commonly used for autism assessment. So in this study, the information was shared by over 6,000 of our clinical patients, um, and they looked at each item on the ADOS and found a difference between the sexes only for hand mannerisms. And that actually didn't impact the overall likelihood of autism being identified for girls by the measure. The second study included over 400 participants from both clinical and research settings, and again, looked at ADOS performance. They found more differences. Um, they found that females presented with less intense symptoms of ASD, um, and that actually did impact whether the ADOS, particularly items related to social communication, identified autism in females. Um, and then the last study here looked at not only the ADOS, but the ADI, which is a clinician-guided parent interview, as well as the SRS, which is a parent uh, rating scale. And they found that when they included sex in their models, um, their models predicting autism improved, but mostly for school-age girls and less so for toddlers. So their conclusions were that children diagnosed younger, under age four, are more similar in their symptom profiles and recognizable by our diagnostic features. They also felt like some girls and women exhibit different um, ASD related difficulties, indicating a need to continue to examine the validity of diagnostic instruments in order to ensure they adequately capture the range of symptoms um, of characteristics of females with autism. So these mixed findings, even in domains within the same measure, highlight the complexity of distinguishing sex differences and the need to consider several factors of influence, um, but also point to limited measure bias in toddlerhood, greater risk in the school age um, and older groups. So taking all these diagnostic and bias related findings together, what do clinicians do? There's a recent publication here um, by Lay, which has some highly relevant suggestions, most, most of which kind of pull in things that we've touched on so far. So clinicians really need to be aware when, when they have a girl presenting for evaluation in front of them that um, superficial social skills may be present, but still may be problematic and, and suggestive of autism, uh, that they may have an interest in social relationships, but may not be accepted by their peers. Their uh, repetitive behaviors may be um, kind of gender normative, but intense. Um, sensory dysfunction can lead to other um, concerns like eating problems or clothing choices. They also, that symptoms may present later due to masking and camouflaging. So um, considering that timeline, and really probing the individual. So as appropriate, based on their language and cognitive level, ask the child, ask, ask the girl, how hard is it for you to sit here and talk with me? How hard is it for you every day? Um, really kind of take that perspective into consideration. So the jury's still kind of out on whether our tools systematically contribute to the underdiagnosis of girls for autism. So we need more research in this and other areas. And so next we'll consider how research participation impacts the diagnostic understanding of girls with autism. So here's kind of an interactive cycle here that, that can be problematic for um, the understanding of girls with autism. So if we have females present with different symptom profiles, they also may be much less likely to be recognized and receive the autism diagnosis. And then less represented in research 
and then that leads to us knowing less about them. Um, you know, this is really important to consider when just designing studies that aim to reduce the impact of heterogeneity on autism research. And I'm going to pause there to define a few basic principles of research and how heterogeneity impacts it in autism. So research depends on statistical methods that in order to be accurate, require enough of that information to evaluate. So for some study designs, the more participants, the more accurate the research. Not for all, but for some. And so what that means is the more information that is included, again, through more participants, the more we can assume that what we learn from any one study applies to the general population of the group that's included in that study. Now, here's where heterogeneity comes in. That's variability within a group. So you probably hear this term applied to autism. It underlies the fact that autism is a spectrum. Um, and so really we need research that defines the area under the is. Um, the spectrum that we want to know more about so we can apply that to that group of people. Um, and so what that means is when we limit the heterogeneity, we limit kind of the pool of people we can ask to be in our studies. And that certainly applies to girls and we'll get there in a second. So I have a kind of just an example here. So if we have a study that wants to know does medicine X treat strep throat, we have participants, we bring in people with strep throat, and then we conclude, ooh, they didn't get better. So this medicine X doesn't treat strep throat. But when the researchers designed their study, they didn't know that medicine X doesn't actually work for strep type A. But they included both people with strep A and strep X. Actually, they had more people with strep A. So that mixed up all the findings and they came to the wrong conclusion. So the moral of the story here is really you, you kind of um, need to know who's in your study and define that really well so that we don't complicate the picture. And you can see how that could complicate things for autism research design, recruitment, and understanding everyone on the spectrum. So when we design these studies, we have to define subtypes, um, such as those in particular age ranges of certain cognitive level, levels or who demonstrate particular behavioral profiles. And so when we narrow and define, again, that pool of participants is limited by who, um, who, is, who is, you know, presenting with those particular concerns. And this is, again, particularly problematic because there are already fewer females on the autism spectrum. So it's made it very difficult, you know, to learn more about girls on the spectrum. As I said before, this may be changing. There is some evidence that more females are being recognized over time. Um, this study here um, that looked at the Danish National Registry had a reduction over, I believe it was 15 years, yeah, where the majority of males from, went from five to one to three to one. And I think importantly, this wasn't in, in, in due to um, you know, fewer males being identified, but due to more females being identified. Um, as I said, the last um, report from the CDC also suggested that the pre prevalence of ASD in females is now over 1%. So we are identifying this better, but I think we can still do better. Um, and that's by kind of um, engaging these females in research. And so we did just that. Um, and Spark is changing that landscape as well. Um, so thank you all for who have participated and in, are interested in Spark. Um, I'm in this last section where, that I'm transitioning to, we're gonna discuss some research that I've conducted using um, the Spark cohort, uh, where thousands of girls, um, again, solving some of these issues I just talked about in research, um, have participated and we've been able to define some groups to really um, better understand um, autism in girls. And so the next we'll talk about extrinsic and intrinsic factors. And so what exactly um, do I mean by that? So intrinsic or kind of biological factors are those within the, within the child. So kind of their developmental milestone timeline, their intellectual functioning, the co-occurring medical conditions they have, 
the autism symptoms they express, as well as external factors, like where do they live? What's their family's income? What was their parents' first concern? Um, and so we wanted to look at if that was different between males and females. And again, we um, used SPARC, uh, the SPARC cohort for this. And um, we had over 18,000 um, individuals because uh, we were limiting by age. So 18 months to 18 years. And what we wound up with uh, over 14,000 boys and almost 4,000 girls um, in our study. So you know, really big numbers that allow us to kind of define our groups and, and have good female representation. And so what we found related to intrinsic factors were that females were more delayed on motor milestones by about one to three months um, compared to boys. And that's um, sitting without support, crawling and walking. Males were more delayed on their language milestones. So by about one to two months compared to girls and using words, combining phrases and complex sentences. Females had slow, uh, were slightly lower on parent report of autism symptoms, but more likely to have intellectual disabilities. Related to extrinsic factors, uh, we found more females in lower income brackets, but not um, in urbanicity. There was no difference in the age at first concern between boys and girls. And then boys uh, were more likely to have co-occurring ADHD versus girls were more likely to have co-occurring mood concerns. Um, also, if we look at parents' first concerns, so we consider this kind of outside of the child, not really a developmental milestone, but what is the parent, you know, worried about? Again, those motor milestones came up for females, um, late walking, again, the mood, um, social was part of that. And then for males, it was a uh, change in loss or skill, late speech and repetitive behaviors. So things that we kind of typically think of as, as, um, autism indicators. And so, um, you know, takeaways from this study, there are certainly um, sex differences in autism for females. So again, we saw those later motor milestones and better language development um, that can lead to delayed identification and potentially access to services. So um, I didn't review this on the prior slides, but um, it took about four months longer for girls to receive their diagnosis. And then that kind of ADHD and mood piece intrigued us. So that led us to kind of wonder how do differences in these co-occurring conditions um, impact presentation. Um, and I'll just stop here one more piece. Again, we saw these motor milestones and better language for females. Again, contraindicated for kind of what we think of some of the early indicators um, of autism. So going back to those um, kind of rule outs or co-occurring conditions, when we think about autism, we also have to think of many other diagnoses to rule out. Um, and so here's a list of things that as clinicians, we're, you know, we're kind of thinking about in our mind um, because they can have similar presentations and overlaps in, in the challenges that they experience. Uh, with language disorders, ADHD, anxieties, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, kids that are gifted. And so, you know, what we're doing when we're thinking of ruling things out, we're thinking of, well, is this one thing or another? Is it a zebra or is it a giraffe? Um, but here's an example of, you know, how a parent can bring a concern and how it can present differently in two commonly co occurring conditions. So in autism, a parent might say, my child really has trouble making friends. And, you know, that could be because they don't have good nonverbal communication. They don't seek enjoyment um, to share enjoyment as readily as others. They are not kind of giving and taking in their play. Um, they may be directing play versus kids with ADHD can have trouble making friends too. But that's because, you know, they're they're kind of all over the place. They might interrupt other people or talk excessively. They might be loud in their play when they should be more quiet or may not listen um, well, or they just can't kind of sustain play and, and keep their attention focused on one thing at a time. And, and all those things can be off-putting to peers too. Um, but for autism, we also have to consider the same list of rule outs as co-occurring conditions. And so unlike the rare um, okapi or zebra giraffe, 
um, 70% of children with autism have at least one co-occurring condition. Uh, oh, ooh, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what just happened there. Here we go. Um, so they can have, and then 40% actually have two or more co-occurring conditions. And so the impact of these conditions on functioning can vary, uh, but we know that individuals with ASD that have other co-occurring medical, behavioral, neurodevelopmental, and psychiatric conditions um, you know, can have other issues. So for example, if you have autism with co-occurring anxiety, you may have more sleep problems or self-injurious behaviors. Um, if you have um, autism and ADHD, for instance, you could have an increased risk of developing anxiety and other mood disorders, or even earlier onset of those anxiety symptoms. And of course, um, those with autism and ADHD are at greater risk for um, executive dysfunction and um, motor movement differences. And that's not surprising given that both autism and ADHD each um, um, are, those things are common in both of those. So executive dysfunction and motor coordination challenges. And so while a handful of studies have attempted to kind of parse apart the impact of these co-occurring conditions, on autism, it's been predominantly male samples because again, we're defining those groups down more and more. So not just autism and the female, but autism, the female and the co-occurring condition. And so the sample sizes get really small, really quick. Um, but if these co-occurring conditions have a differential impact on a girl versus a boy, you know, that's important to know because um, that could increase the chances that autism will be misdiagnosed or symptoms of autism could be misattributed to other co-occurring conditions, something um, we call diagnostic overshadowing. And so um, our next study, again, um, used the power of SPARC to define some very specific groups. And I'll get into all those groups on our next slide. Um, but we started with 25,000 um, kids aged six to 18, almost 20,000 males and over 5,000 uh, females. And we looked at their developmental and medical history as well as social uh, functioning, repetitive and restrictive behaviors and motor functioning. And our um, hypothesis was that the co-occurring conditions would increase um, social motor and repetitive behavior symptoms but specifically, we felt like ADHD would lead, lead to more motor concerns and anxiety to more repetitive behaviors as those are kind of shared areas of weakness between the two um, conditions. And so first, I'll just start and tell you about our group. So this shows that we had kind of, again, that overall sample of 25,000 participants. And then we had those with autism alone, autism and ADHD, autism and anxiety, and then autism with ADHD and anxiety. And what's notable about this slide is that um, we looked at the ratios of males to females and you know, our overall ratio um, was around four to one, but in those with co-occurring anxiety, it dropped to close to three and one. And then it was above four to one, um, meaning more boys in the ADHD um, group. So we're finding that um, you know, more males in general are diagnosed with ADHD. So it's not surprising that there's an overrepresentation of males in the autism and ADHD group. And the same thing for um, autism and anxiety, um, more females there. So that's the first thing to point out. So then what we looked at was um, the impact of having co-occurring conditions and how that lead, impacts uh, age of diagnosis. And so what we found here was that um, females with co-occurring anxiety were often not diagnosed till after age eight. Um, and that's compared to males who were diagnosed around age six. Um, their delay in diagnosis, males were overall diagnosed earlier as, as we've already talked about, um, but their diagnosis was most impacted by a co-occurring ADHD diagnosis. So the, they were diagnosed later if they had ADHD, not necessarily anxiety. What I will say is we don't know the timing of these diagnoses. So we don't know if ADHD and anxiety were diagnosed before they received their autism diagnosed. 
but that is often something we see clinically. Um, so that would be my suspicion that for many of these kids, they were given the autism or the ADHD or an anxiety diagnosis first. Um, and again, that the overshadowing of the autism um, was that the symptoms and the difficulties they were experiencing were attributed to either the ADHD, the anxiety, and, and not until later was, was um, the autism identified. So now we were even able to get more um, nuanced by our group. So not only do we have all these diagnostic groups, and I know there's a lot on this slide, so I'm, I'm kind of just gonna talk you through it, um, but we have age groups too. So we looked at all of those diagnostic groups and then we looked at school age kids, so six to 12, and then we looked at 12 to six to just under 12, and then 12 to almost 18 year olds to see if, if the impact of co-occurring conditions um, varied by, by age. And so what we found was the first two, um, two graphs here are um, autism, parent reported autism symptoms. The top one is the younger age group. The bottom is the older age group. Um, the black bars are female and the gray bars are male. And what we found was that for parent reported autism symptoms, males overall had more symptoms than females, but this was most prominent in young girls with ASD alone, and then older girls with ASD and co-occurring anxiety. So the girls with autism alone um, at school age, um, you know, they were being underestimated. And then potentially girls with autism and anxiety at older ages, some of their symptoms may be with attributed to their anxiety instead of autism. On the next, in the middle, uh, we have um, parent reported motor skills. And what we found here is for young girls, particularly those with autism alone, or those with um, autism and anxiety, they had better motor skills than boys. And then the addition of ADHD, as expected, decreased motor skill functioning across groups. And then lastly, for repetitive behavior, so that's the, the one on the end, we had a bit of a surprising finding where our young girls showed more repetitive behaviors across diagnostic groups than the boys, which we didn't see for older girls. However, across groups, those with autism and anxiety, including when ADHD was present, had more repetitive behaviors. So this was one of our most compelling findings from, from this, this uh, slide here, because the literature often suggests that males actually display, and I talked about this before, more repetitive behaviors than females. Um, and so a lot of that literature is based on, um, again, that ADOS and the ABI, which are kind of broad measures of um, autism symptoms. However, our study is using a specific measure um, that's really kind of teasing apart dimensions of repetitive behaviors. And so it might be that we're capturing a wider breadth of those repetitive behaviors and interests um, compared to the more omnibus measures. And so that might, you know, be a better option to, to um, you know, probe for symptoms in girls. So using either specific, more specific interview questions or, or parent report measures, because um, other literature that has looked at the repetitive behavior scale has found that items related to things like insistence on sameness, compulsions, hoarding, and sometimes self-injurious behavior like pulling your hair or scratching yourself is being elevated in females. Um, and that contributes to differences in the repetitive behaviors by sex. And so, um, you know, I think that this is really interesting that if we kind of, you know, again, tease apart these repetitive behaviors that may, you know, we, they may just look a little bit different for females, um, but they're, they still are there. So some of our takeaways from this project was that males are overrepresented with ADHD, males with autism, and females with autism with anxiety, that co-occurring conditions delay autism diagnosis, particularly anxiety in girls, um, that co-occurring conditions can reduce sex differences in reported autism symptoms. So when a girl has a co-occurring condition, they can be rated as having more autism symptoms. Co-occurring ADHD leads to greater reported motor difficulties and co-occurring conditions impact uh, repetitive behaviors by age where young females show more repetitive behaviors than their male peers. 
Um, and then broadly, you know, school age females were kind of at the greatest risk for underestimation of their autism related symptoms. So I think that's something big to think about when you have a girl, um, you know, a school age girl in front of you to really kind of probe through all the symptoms. And then um, again, across the ages, be sure to kind of tease apart those social communication, repetitive behaviors and motor problems in girls with autism or co-occurring conditions. All right, so as we wrap up our discussion, um, I'm gonna quickly touch on some things that may be just inherent about being a female. And so there's um, one theory called the genetic, or the female protective theory. And essentially this su suggests, and I have a visual here kind of, that females require some kind of greater environmental or genetic risk than males to express the same degree of autistic characteristics. And in that way, females are kind of protected. Um, and so this kind of scale show, is kind of illustrating this, that you know, if you have the same degree of genetic environmental factors, the girl might not get the diagnosis of autism or might not show symptoms of autism in the same way that the boy does. But in, instead it takes more for the girl to kind of present with the sufficient symptoms. There's mixed evidence um, for this. Um, so things in support suggest that females possess maybe relatively more spontaneously non-inherited inherited mutations associated with autism than males, despite having a similar presentation. Um, but inconsistently there's you know, support for increased autism traits and relatives of, of females. So that isn't kind of also supporting um, this idea. And then the fact that no specific protective factor has been demonstrated yet suggests that maybe this isn't, isn't you know, the right theory, um, but um, one of the ideas out there. So no talk about girls on the autism spectrum would be complete without a discussion of masking and camouflaging. And so this brief discussion we'll, we'll touch on here doesn't kind of do this topic, it's, it's fair justice. I, mean, I could spend an entire talk on the subject, but um, some autistic individuals do learn, I would say some many, um, to either they learn or they implicitly develop the ability to compensate, mask, and assimilate. And, and this can be conscious, it can be unconscious, to kind of fit in and, and make social situations more comfortable. And all people kind of camouflage in some way. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I'm doing my best to, to be a good speaker and certainly that's anxiety provoking, but you know, th this will pass and, and I'll go on with my day. But for those with autism, it's, you know, this process or this, this activity is exhausting, it's ongoing, and it can certainly lead to anxiety and distress. Um, and so examples include mimicking facial expression of others and interactions, forcing eye contact, suppress, suppressing discussing interests or repetitive behaviors when that's really what's comfortable for them. And so another possible compound in the diagnostic evaluation is the effect of, of camouflaging and how females in particular may suppress their symptoms, um, not only during social interactions, but during the clinical medical observation. Um, and so if females are masking at a higher rate or doing so more frequently, their diagnosis could be missed at a higher rate. And so if you couple that with the fact that clinician observation may um, observe fewer concerns for female than parent report or self-report measure in these interactions between these int intrinsic and extrinsic um, factors, um, you know, all lead to a delay in recognition and diagnosis. So as I mentioned before, it's really important when possible to engage in a conversation, um, you know, with that child um, about um, their experience um, because that's um, critically important in the process. So here's what I hope um, the, I've shared for you um, to take away from this talk. Uh, we'll have some time um, for questions. Um, but that fam females are under-recognized on the autism spectrum. There are multiple contributing factors to this involving both intrinsic and extrinsic characteristics. 
um, and that co-occurring mental health conditions are more common in females and, and can further delay this diagnosis. So I'm gonna fast forward through the references for this talk. I just wanted them to be included with the slides um, if anyone takes a look at them later. Um, I want to acknowledge SPARC and the Sex Differences Working Group, the SPARC Central Team, my colleagues at Kennedy Krieger and CARD that are included in all those references, as well as everyone who has participated in SPARC. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I will, I will stop at this point. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Wadka and we, uh, yes, we do have about 10 minutes for questions and we've received quite a few. So I'm going to start with some that are more related to your sex differences work and some of the things you talked about. And then we do have quite a few suggestions if, if maybe you have some research that's top of mind for, for some related research. So just starting things off with uh, one of the things you just touched on, the female protective theory. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, are, do you see any, any differences in concordance in twins that are in line with this theory? So, for example, fraternal twins, where it's a, a male and female twin, uh, if they have less ASD concordance than male, male, fraternal, or, or the same sex twins? So, I, I have to say, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, <laughs> I, that I'm, my assumption would be some of the literature would be based on twin studies. Um, but I'm not, I'm not positive of that. Um, and then just, this is just more of a general question, but something you talked quite a bit about was, you know, repetitive behaviors. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and we just had a few people just asking if you could just give some examples of what some of those common repetitive behaviors might be. I think you might have mentioned it throughout, but it's come up a, a little bit. For females or just in general? Um, I think... We had questions about both, but if I guess start with females would be more topical. Sure. So, you know, I I think you know when we're looking at repetitive behaviors, we're looking both at um, restricted interests, and so for females, um, they may you know we're we're finding that the interests themselves may be more. Um, age appropriate. Um, so things like animals and art, um, psychology and biology, um, but the intensity of them is, is high. And so that's what gets in the way. So, you know, when they interact with peers, all they want to do is art projects and, and sometimes peers want to do other things. And so, you know, versus sometimes, you know, we see in boys that the interest not only is intense, but it's it's unusual. So they're interested in kind of the parts of objects. So they're interested in the wheels of the car instead of the car as a whole, or they may be interested um, in string um, and they bring string with them everywhere. Um, and that's kind of where too, um, restricted behaviors and, and re repetitive patterns of behavior overlap with sensory differences. And so, um, you know, in the recent um, diagnostic criteria, sensory differences also falls in that category. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we see some of the sensory differences in girls um, related to potentially kind of clothing choices or food choices, um, which again can, um, you know, kind of just fall under the radar versus, you know, for males, we might see things that are more um, apparent, again, carrying string around. Um, and then, you know, also under that umbrella falls motor stereotypies. So hand flapping, pacing, rocking, things like that. Great, thank you. Um, so given that ADHD can also be under recognized in girls, how might this influence your findings about co-occurring autism and ADHD, if at all? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly could play a part. Um, you know, we did find that um, boys were more likely to be identified um, with ADHD than girls, and girls more so with anxiety. So I think, um, you know, that 
that in some ways kind of confirms your question. Um, you know, I think it, it certainly could be an underestimate so that, you know, if, if we're not um, identifying ADHD in girls as, as much as boys, then certainly that over um, representation of males could be um, a product of that for sure. Um, and then, you know, you closed out your talk, of course, with some conclusions and, and uh, from the research, but what are some, maybe just one or two key takeaways for uh, parents of a female child who has received uh, an autism diagnosis? And what, like, what can they take from their study and maybe bring to their clinical appointments? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think some, some of the key is that, you know, for many of these girls kind of, and I know I keep talking about anxiety, but, you know, I, I talk about anxiety as like, as an observer, you see the tip of someone's anxiety, everything that's underlying, you know, you don't see, you don't experience, you only know what they share with you. And I think the more we learn about girls on the spectrum, the more we're learning that it's the same way for them. Like we, they really kind of internalize a lot of what they're experiencing. And, you know, that can lead to a lot of stress, um, a lot of just internal discord. And so I think, um, you know, really um, kind of helping your daughter or your, um, your girl um, self-advocate and share and be able to have safe spaces to, to do that, I think is really important. Um, I think, um, you know, sharing that with their providers, um, you know, sharing strategies that, that work for them. Um, again, taking, you know, taking their, um, their experience, you know, into account and, and developing um, their routines and, and kind of the supports and the accommodations that they need that are going to help them um, kind of have the best, um, you know, self-determination. And then sort of in a similar vein, but kind of the opposite end of the coin, I, I suppose you might say, is what are some takeaways for special education teachers or even general education teachers? Like what can they do or how can they use the research to help themselves better support the girls with autism in their classrooms? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to the same point, trying to really appreciate the, the child's perspective, um, you know, have them um, be able to self-advocate, advocate for themselves, um, considering their goals. Um, uh, but also, you know, understanding that, you know, uh, ways to support emotion regulation, um, you know, just decrease use of abstract language, um, you know, visuals are, everyone probably already knows that, but, um, you know, helping with generalization of skills. So girls can be very good at, you know, learning a skill in a certain way, but then not kind of applying it flexibly. Um, so, um, you know, I think just being, you know, not only, you know, the adult that's providing the structure and, and the instruction, but also being a good kind of, um, you know, listener and, and understanding the perspective of the child as well. And then I think one, this might be our, our last question, um, something that I think a lot of people what will probably resonate with a lot of people from your talk is the idea of the girls being misdiagnosed and you know parents struggling to get the correct diagnoses uh, for their for their children. What, what well, you know you bring your child to an appointment perhaps they're misdiagnosed and you you want to see you want to see them be reevaluated. What, how, what do you suggest for parents? Like, what is the next step that they should do? What is a certain test they should request or a certain where should they go next if they receive that misdiagnosis or don't receive a diagnosis at all? That's, I guess that's a tricky question because, um, you know, as I showed before, not, not everybody who has certain challenges has autism. Sometimes the other diagnoses better capture um, 
you know, the child's needs. And I think this goes back to why we kind of diagnose children or anyone in general is because the idea of a diagnosis gives us some kind of expectation of, of, of what we can expect, what, which we look for, which we plan for, what services are going to work best, what, you know, what, what can we do that we know based on other people who have had similar difficulties, you know, what, what's our best plan forward. And so, you know, I think that, you know, whatever diagnosis you're given, unless you feel like there was something really kind of inappropriate that happened during that evaluation, um, you know, you can, you can kind of see how your child responds to what was recommended. And then if you're, you know, not seeing, if you're not seeing progress, then, then there maybe is reason to think, hey, maybe something was missed in this. Um, and then, you know, many centers will provide second opinions. Um, you know, sometimes it's not that it was necessarily missed. It just doesn't present till later as well. Um, and so that's why often we do follow kids over time too. Um, so I don't know that there's a specific test. I think that, um, you know, taking an evaluation is, again, as long as you, you know, don't feel like some, some in some way it was, you know, not done appropriately and you know trying what's recommended and you know seeing whether there's a response or not you know and i also oh, it's tough to kind of apply this broadly to every situation right because you also don't want to lose precious time um to get the right treatment so this also i think has to be where kind of parental instinct comes into play and if you're you know really feeling like this something you know there's more going on Ask to see someone else, talk to your pediatrician, um, seek that second opinion. Um, you know, you're your, again, I think I said this already, you're your child's best advocate and you know your child best. Um, so I think there are different ways to approach it. Um, you can, you know, try what's recommended. You can seek that second opinion. And again, it might just be that at this point, there's, you know, not enough, but maybe at a later point in time there is and, and different approaches are appropriate at, at different time points.